Welcome to the RLH Projects podcast, Love Matters, where we talk about real academic research mixed with real life experiences to hopefully improve the real relationships you have with important people in your life. I'm the founder of the RLH Project and the host of the Love Matters podcast, Dr. Jenny Rozier. I'm also an associate professor of communication studies at James Madison University, a wife to my favorite person on the planet, a mother of four young children, and an all-around love enthusiast. As an expert in romantic and parent-child relationships, I've dedicated my life to figuring out how individuals can use communication to live happy, healthy lives connected to other people. I hope that this podcast can help you. Hello, friends. This is the first season of the RLH Projects podcast, Love Matters. For season one, I decided to do an in-depth 12-episode explanation of a single concept that impacts us all, attachment. I actually teach a class at James Madison University in the School of Communication Studies called Attachment Communication, and much of this season's podcast is based on my lectures from that class. And so that's the plan for season one of the Love Matters podcast, an in-depth 12-episode explanation of the science of attachment with relevant stories from myself and a ton of cool people I know sprinkled throughout. Lucky for you, I'm not just offering a podcast to help you understand attachment. I've also created a 60-page digital workbook that you can purchase through the link in my Instagram bio, at Relationships Love Happiness, or on my website, www.relationshipsloveshappiness.com. This digital workbook not only complements the podcast, but it also includes extra attachment tips and information not covered in the podcast and includes self-reflection prompts throughout that will encourage you to dig deep and reflect on your own past and current life experiences. Before you start listening to this episode, get yourself a copy of the Attachment Matters digital workbook. You won't regret it. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. No matter what time it is, no matter where you are, I am so thankful that you're spending your time with me. Today, in episode four, I'm going to talk about attachment in middle childhood and adolescence. If you're following along in the Attachment Matters digital workbook, we're on chapter four. After early childhood, right around five years old, children enter middle childhood, and their worlds get much larger. The number of people they interact with on a daily basis significantly increases, especially if you have them in school. Think about it. Even if you had them in daycare before five years old, they really only interacted with their little class. They might have had some interactions with other kids on the playground area, but mostly just their little class. When they go to elementary school, they interact with lots of people. I don't know how large most elementary schools are, but my children's elementary school has 500 students in it. That's a lot of people that they're interacting with. Not to mention all of the extracurricular activities, like a sports team that they play on, which lots of people don't get their children involved in that many activities until around five years old. So their worlds get much larger, and they also tend to start doing things by themselves. They experience part of their lives without you nearby. Sometimes it's a large part of their lives. Think about how many hours a day they go to school. Or if they go to a child care, um, you know, an after-school program after school, that's even more hours. And a lot of people, when they take their kids to their extracurriculars, are dropping them off at this age. So they spend a lot of time without you, which can be difficult for parents. As a parent, you have less control over what they experience, and it becomes increasingly more difficult to scaffold them from negative life experiences, right? If a child is mean to them at school, you can't protect them until they talk to you about it later. You definitely can't protect them during the, in the moment because you're not there. 
In addition to the lifestyle changes that your child is experiencing, their attachment needs shift. So if you remember from um, episode two, the primary attachment needs of a infant is desires for proximity and consistent responsiveness. When children enter middle childhood, their desires change from proximity and responsiveness to emotional availability and accessibility. So while most children have a relatively solid attachment foundation by this age group, attachment is still malleable. It can potentially become more insecure due to you know, caregiver reactions during negative life experiences or a lack of emotional connection with a parent or a lack of feelings like they can count on their parents. So uh, accessibility, their parent will always be there for them. Or you can potentially become more secure building on that um, insecure foundation or that already secure foundation. Children can become more secure when a caregiver changes their behaviors or continues to reflect feelings of safety and security in the child. But as I noted in episode two, and I'll continue to say it throughout this podcast series, the attachment foundation that is developed in the first few years of life is always there. So if a child has a secure attachment foundation, their life experiences can change that, right? It can change their attachment perspective throughout their life to be more, even more secure or to become insecure, but that foundation is always there. So that foundation, that secure foundation, helps them get through any of the negative life experiences that they will experience in their life. Oppositely, if there is an insecure attachment foundation from the early years, that foundation is always there. It's always going to be there, impacting the way that they navigate through the world. It is possible to build attachment security on top of that foundation. But it's important to know that the foundation is always there. Feeling safe and secure is still very important to an older child. So what can you do? You can create an environment where your child believes that you are on their team and like they can always come to you. One of the things that my husband and I do to always let our kids know that we're on their team is with school. So we have twin 11-year-olds. One is a boy and one is a girl. And our son, Gavin, is, I don't know, he gets in trouble at school periodically. (laughs) And he gets in trouble for dumb stuff too. So let me preface that. Um, He's not shanking anybody in the bathroom. Let's be clear. Uh, He (laughs) gets in trouble at school and his teacher might give us a call or the principal might give us a call. And, you know, they want us to talk to him while he's in the principal's office about something that he's done. And when I say he's done something stupid, I I actually mean something stupid. One time his principal called me while I was at work to tell me that my son would not stop touching the walls in the hallway as they walked in line with their class. I asked her, to repeat herself, not because I hadn't heard her, but because I wanted her to hear how ridiculous it sounded that she was calling me at work for my son refusing to stop touching the walls as he walked down the hallway. He was just dragging his hands on the walls, and when a teacher asked him to not do it, he did it again, and when a teacher asked him to not do it, Then he did it again and got sent to the principal's office. To say that my child's elementary school makes mountains out of molehills is a understatement. One of the things that we do with our children, with all four of them, is we tell them that if they get in trouble at school for something, then they're not going to get in trouble at home 
for the same thing. I I think if it was something really, really serious, then yes, we would potentially have a punishment at home. But like I said, my children are still all in, they just, the oldest two just finished elementary school. So up to this point, everyone's been in elementary school. Nobody's been, you know, doing anything too terrible. So if they get in trouble at school, they don't get in trouble at home. And what this does for them, it does a couple things for them. First of all, it makes them realize that we are on their team, right? We are always on their team. We love them unconditionally. We are always there for them. A second thing that it does, though, and this is also a bit of an attachment benefit, in my opinion, is that when they get in trouble at school, they're not stressed out about it the rest of the day until they see us and have to tell us, right? I think that a lot of times kids get in trouble and at school specifically, and then their stomach is in knots the whole rest of the day. Maybe they're sad or scared or worried the whole rest of the day until they have to face their parent and tell them what happened or face their parent who already knows what happened. It's an unnecessary stress for them to have. And so that is our rule. And that is one way that we try to create an environment where our child believes, they believe that we are on their team and that they can always come to us. It also makes it so that at the end of the day, when we do meet up with them, that they're willing to have a conversation with us. They've calmed down. They're not stressed out. They're not scared about what their at-home punishment is. And they're willing to sit down and talk about why they didn't stop touching the walls. Another thing you can do is give your child daily undivided attention and physical comfort. Now, that undivided attention part, that can get tricky when if you have a full-time job, if you have a lot of things you have to do when you get home, if you have multiple children. Believe me, I know we have four, and we struggle every day to give each child any amount of undivided attention. But I want to be clear when I say that it doesn't have to be an hour. You know, work in five or ten minute increments. Take five minutes out of your day to have a conversation one-on-one with one of your children. Take 10 minutes out of your day to play a game of Uno with one of your children. One-on-one, undivided attention. You're not paying attention to the other sibling. You're not paying attention to the dinner that's cooking. You're not playing on your phone. You're not doing anything. You're giving them complete undivided attention attention, for them to be able to talk with you, to relax with you, to laugh with you. Often parents will ask me about things that they can do to help their children feel loved and lovable. And my response is always to laugh with them. That is one of the best ways for children to feel like they are an enjoyable human being. Think about that idea, an enjoyable human being. Don't we all want that? We all want to feel like people enjoy being around us, that people like being around us. And one of the best ways you can do that is to smile and laugh around your children. I prescribe that um, often to parents, laugh and smile around your children And it sounds really simple and like, of course, people laugh all the time. People smile all the time. But I really can't tell you how many times I have sat at the end of the day and thought about how much I've smiled with my kids. And it's hard to think of how many times I've done it. I'm being really honest here. I've had days where at the end of the day, I think, did I laugh with them today? Did I smile with them today? Or was I just, you know, micromanaging, bossing them, reprimanding them, um, 
trying to get them to do their homework, yelling at them for leaving trash on the floor, right? Is that all I did today with them? Did I smile and laugh? And sometimes the answer to that question is no, I didn't. I didn't. And so I think that that is one way of giving some attention to your children is to smile and laugh with them. And also, physical comfort is really important. I think a lot of people think of giving their children physical comfort when they're babies and toddlers and preschoolers, and it's like a no-brainer. This is a tiny person that needs snuggling and hugs, but older kids need it too. Older kids 100% need it. Just yesterday... My son, Gavin, and I, 11 years old, were at each other's throats a bit throughout the day, to say the least. (laughs) He had been being rather rude to his siblings, and I was reprimanding him for his rudeness, being rude to him, you know, uh, the pot calling the kettle black, and that was causing him to be more rude, and it was an endless cycle. And at the end of the day, right before we had, or right after dinner, that's what it was, it was right after dinner, we put a movie on, and I sat in the corner of the couch where I usually sit, and I'm trying to, you know, prepare any uh, posts for the RLH project the next day, and checking my email, and doing some things on my phone while they're watching this movie that they're really interested in. And Gavin is sitting in our recliner by himself. And I just, in that moment, I realized I needed to do some kind of repair for what had gone on throughout the day. So I said, Gavin, come sit with me. And he came over and he sat next to me with his body touching my body. And he took my arm and he put it around him so that I would hug him while we watched the movie. I subsequently put my phone down and hugged him for the next hour. At one point, I got up to use the restroom, and he was like, Mom, come back. I said, okay, I'm, I'll come back. I'll, just a minute. He's 11. He needs physical comfort, too. He needs physical touch, and I think we forget that a lot when we have older children. A third thing that you can do is to always protect your child from traumatic experiences when possible. So anything that could potentially be a traumatic life experience, you really need to work hard at protecting them from that experience. It doesn't mean that you should lie to your children, right? They're a little older. They understand things better than you think they do. This doesn't mean that you should lie, but you should limit the amount of exposure they have to the traumatic life experience. And if you cannot, right, you don't have the ability to limit their exposure to the trauma, then you need to do more emotion coaching attachment work than if you are able to limit their exposure to the trauma. So you need to talk with them frequently, frequently, as much as possible. You need to have other important adults in their life talk to them about what they're going through, about how they're feeling about what they're going through, and about, you know, what the future could hold. And I hope that it's a hopeful future. Now let's talk about some things that you can say when you're trying to build attachment with a child who is in middle childhood. You can first express your unconditional love and support. So this is where you can say things like, I love you no matter what happens. I can't tell you how many times I tell my kids that. I love you no matter what grades you get. You know, I would love it if you would get really good grades, but I love you no matter what grades you get. I love you no matter how well you do in your wrestling tournament. You know, I'm proud of you for trying. I'm proud of you for for participating. Express your unconditional love and support. This can be kind of difficult sometimes, especially if your child is in a phase where they are using a lot of nasty, mean communication. So my boys, they... Um, argue a lot with each other. 
They argue over each other's things. They argue over looking at each other. They argue over touching each other. They argue over, I mean, I, I can't even list all of the things they argue over. And most of their arguments in my perspective, from my perspective, it, most of their arguments are quite ridiculous. You know, they're arguing over dumb shit. It's, it's ridiculous. But most of the time, it's just like a normal sibling rivalry, sibling argument. Sometimes, though, it can turn to be kind of nasty. And that's when it can be difficult as a parent to be kind and loving and sensitive to your nasty child, right? Your child that's saying nasty things, who's has an attitude all day long, and then you as an adult are supposed to be kind and loving towards them. It can be difficult to do. But saying things like, I love you no matter, you know, what you say to your brother. I know that you love your brother. I know you don't mean those words. I wish that you would not say those words, but I love you when you're upset. I love you when you're sad. I love you when you're angry. I love you when you're mean. I love you when you're happy. I love you in all of the shades of you. That is one thing that you can say. Another thing you can say is to communicate your commitment. So these are phrases like, um, I'm always here for you. So anytime you want to talk about something, anytime you need me, I can be where you are. I mean, within reason, but I'm always here for you whenever you need me. This is kind of like that I'll always be on your team um, phrase that you should say. I'll come get you whenever you need me, right? If you're at a friend's house, if you are at the mall, if you are at um, the ice skating rink, if you are uh, at school and you really need me, I am just a phone call away. Call me and I will stop what I'm doing and I will come get you. Remember, the two main attachment needs in middle childhood are desires for emotional availability and desires for accessibility. So children need to know that you're there for them and that you're emotionally available. So like physically available and you're, they're accessible to you or you're accessible to them and that you are emotionally available to communicate with them about things that are going on in their life. You can also welcome disclosures and talk about their interests. So this one is pretty interesting in my uh, in my family. Sometimes your kids are in activities or have interests that you don't think are that interesting. <laughs> That's the best way I can put it. Um, but if they like it, then you should show interest. You should be supportive of it. I remember that um, one of our children, Paxton, who's eight now, but last year he was, I guess because kids at school were into Pokemon, playing Pokemon cards. He didn't really know how it how to play it. We didn't have Pokemon cards at our house, but he got interested in it. And... I think that it's kind of a weird hobby. That's just my opinion. And so it was difficult for me and my husband to like get into it with him. It has passed and he's not really into it anymore. So that's helpful. But sometimes as parents, we have to be interested in things that maybe we're not normally interested in. And uh, this can be a little tricky. So you can say things like, I'm glad that you're talking to me about this, or that book you're reading looks so cool, or I heard that this Pokemon card was, I don't even know, I'm using the wrong terminology, I heard this Pokemon card was like a destroyer card or something. <laughs> I've lost all of the lingo, I don't even remember it. But the important part is that you should welcome disclosures and talk about things that they're interested in. So encourage them to tell you about things that they like, that they don't like. Like I said, that they think they might want to do, that they might want to be interested in, that they might want to read about. Encourage them to tell you those things. And then 
the last thing that you can say is you can tell them that you think about them when you are not with them. This is something that lots of people would love to know, that someone they love is thinking about them when they're not with them. This is why we like those little gifts that our friends give us or our romantic partners. It's, yeah, of course we like the gift, but uh, it's really less about the tangible gift. And more often than not, it's about the idea that they were at a store or they were somewhere where you were not, and they saw something that reminded them of you. And they thought about you when you weren't around. And then they thought about it being so perfect for you and they care about you so much that they got it for you. This is what this, that's what happens with little kids when you tell them that you're thinking about them. So every single day when I pick my kids up from school, I tell them every single day without fail, I've been thinking about you all day. I've been thinking about you guys all day. I've missed you. It's just something that is in my pattern of communication. It's in my routine that I try to say every single day. And adding this to my routine causes my children to feel loved. When I talked about early childhood attachment, there was an emphasis on the idea that When a baby or a small child cries or is upset, they need you to help them downregulate their stress. And so they come to you, they're upset, you hug them, you comfort them with your words, and they build an internal working model that tells them that you are trustworthy, that you'll be there for them, that you will help them calm down, that you will help them when they are in distress. This doesn't just go away in middle childhood. They might not need you as much to help them downregulate their stress. They're starting to develop their own set of coping mechanisms. And so they're not going to need you as frequently as an infant or a toddler or a preschooler might need you. But they still need you. And especially if you are a secure base for them, if you are that secure attachment figure for them, when they are upset, they are going to want to turn to you because you have always made them feel better up to this point. And so they're going to come to you when they are in emotional distress, when something happened at school or when their sibling was mean to them or when they're just feeling down. They're going to come to you in hopes that you will help them downregulate their stress. And if they have had success with this in the past, they're going to come to you all the time when they need you to help them downregulate their own stress. Adults do this. This is not you know, a childlike thing to do. Adults do this. When I've had a bad day at work, I come home and I decompress with my husband and I tell him all about it. And he might hug me or put his arm around me and listen to what I have to say. This is a normal pattern of behavior. Something happens, a child gets upset, they return to their caregiver for help with the upset, to help them feel better about the situation, to feel connected to someone, to feel like understood by someone, to feel validated by someone. And so these are the kinds of things that we are looking for when we go to someone else for emotional support. And children do this at a very young age. Let's listen to Rachel, mom of three, ages 12, 7, and 4 talk about what she does when one of her older children is upset. I'm a big firm believer in deep breaths and um, even now with you know with my soon-to-be 13 year old I I get down on her level I sit her down next to me and you know we look each other in the eyes and I, I say okay like let's take a deep breath. And, you know, for me, it's always been really important that 
I get on the same level with my kids when I'm asking them to emotionally grapple with something. Um, because I want them to understand that I'm there with them when they're feeling the things that they're feeling. Rachel's strategy for comforting her children when they're upset hits lots of the tips that I talked about a few minutes ago. So it expresses her unconditional love and support. She lets them know that they can feel their feelings. It communicates her commitment to them. She sits with them. She gets on eye level. She tells them that she's here for them whenever they need her. And it also welcomes disclosures. So she has a loving tone, a calm tone, and it encourages her children to want to come and talk to her. This helps build the attachment bond that she has with each of her children. When thinking about building attachment in middle childhood, there's several things that you should avoid. And by several, I mean there's a ton, but I'm going to focus on four of them because I think they're really popular, common things that parents say to their children or do with their children, and it's really important that you avoid these things. The first one is shaming. So when you say things like, why can't you act your age? Or don't tuck your shirt in, it looks bad. That is causing them to feel shameful about themselves, and it's not helping create a secure attachment bond um, with you. The second one is minimizing feelings. You shouldn't say things like, stop crying so much. You shouldn't care about this. Don't let it bother you. I get it. It's really easy to say these things because a lot of times when kids are upset, they're upset about things that from from an adult's perspective seem kind of ridiculous. I remember one time my daughter came home from school and she was very upset and she was crying, like sobbing, crying, very upset. And when I asked her what happened, she said that a boy in class had pulled her chair out from under her when she stood up to reach something. And I said, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Were you embarrassed when you fell on the ground? And she said, oh, I didn't actually fall. But I almost did. And I, (laughs) in my head, I just thought, okay, so why are you so upset? She's like, well, I caught him. But then, you know, he made a mean look at me. And, you know, that, it, it just upset me. So from my perspective, it was kind of a trivial thing to be so upset about. So it's easy to say things like, oh, don't let this bother you. This isn't a big deal. Or why are you so upset? This, don't get over it. But it doesn't help anyone. A third thing that you should, do, should avoid doing is ignoring your child's attempts to share their life. Like I said earlier, this can happen when you're, like, frankly, not interested in the things they're interested in. Anytime your child wants to share with you something that they are excited about, that they want to learn more about, or that they're interested in, you should welcome that. And the fourth thing is blaming them for negative feelings or behaviors. Unfortunately, I've done this more than I'd like to admit. I have had many instances where my kids have been chaotic and wild and loud And I've just lost my temper. And then I've said something like, you caused our day to be ruined. Blaming them for my negative feelings is really immature. I'm in charge of my own feelings. I have control over my own feelings. And making your children believe that they are the cause of your upset, of your negative emotions is not okay. It should be avoided as much as you can. I'm working on it. Around 12 years of age, give or take a year, children leave middle childhood 
and embark on the journey that is adolescence. Ah, the teenage years. Adolescence is often described by parents as this wonderful time filled with soul-searching, boundary-pushing, introspection, the silent treatment, and from what I've heard, ups and downs like you wouldn't believe. Totally looking forward to it. (laughs) The fact of the matter is that adolescence is characterized by significant neurological, cognitive, and socio-psychological development. During this life phase, the amount of time spent with parents typically drops while the amount of time spent with friends typically increases. Regardless of how much time you actually get to spend with your teen, parents continue to play a role in their development. Secure attachment with teenagers is associated with less engagement in high-risk behaviors, fewer mental health issues, and enhanced social skills and coping strategies. For a full review of this line of research, you can see Moretti and Pellet's 2004 article in Pediatric Child Health. I think it's important to also talk about how attachment figures tend to shift during this life phase. It's really common for this to happen. In early childhood, a child's primary caregiver is their attachment figure. It's like a parent or a grandparent, a nanny, a child care provider, anyone who spends a significant amount of time with the baby, toddler, or preschooler. So even a teacher at a daycare center could become a attachment figure for a child, especially if they're spending, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week with them. In middle childhood, primary caregivers continue to be important attachment figures, but new attachment figures could be found in a teacher or in a friend's parents, especially if your child's spending a lot of time with their friend at their friend's house. Adolescence is a bit different. Uh, Primary caregivers and other important adults in a teenager's life are still attachment figures, but this is an interesting time when peers like friends and romantic partners, have the potential to become attachment figures as well. Something else that shifts during this time is the attachment needs of the teenagers. So in early childhood, young children require close proximity, sensitive responsiveness. In middle childhood, the attachment needs change to emotional connection and accessibility. In adolescence, the attachment needs kind of go back to responsiveness. (laughs) So that sensitive responsiveness and emotional connection are the main attachment needs of an adolescent. Here's Helen, a mom of three, ages 15, 13, and 9. Listen to her as she talks about one of the other transitions she's noticed in her own children between middle childhood and adolescence. And they also deal with the way they express their emotions a little bit differently. I guess that's the different transition from, I guess, um, adolescence to like teenage years where they tend to revert a little bit more inward versus I guess when they're younger they tend to pretty much openly express themselves very freely and uh, they're not really afraid to show any emotion. So what can parents do to build attachment security with their teenagers? Well first it's really important to be in tune with your teen so even if they try to push you out you really need to work hard at asking them about their day, showing interest in their lives, in their relationships with others, talking about their hobbies, their extracurricular activities, really continuing to communicate to them that you want to be part of their lives, even if they seem like they don't want you to be part of their lives. You want to always let them know that you are there for them if and when they want to let you in. 
The second thing you can do as a parent is to be sensitive to their emotions. So whether they want to share them with you or not, it is really important to be sensitive to their emotions. And this is part of that being in tune part, right? If you're in tune with your child, you're able to know what their triggers are, to know the kinds of things that can make them angry, that can make them sad. You're able to tell when they are maybe pushing down an emotion, like pushing down some sadness, and you can inquire about their feelings and just give them the opportunity anytime they need it to feel their feelings with you. Since I don't have teenagers myself yet, I thought I would give a story from my own teenager life Um, I remember very specifically a time when I had gotten in an argument with one of my best friends in high school, and it tore me up. I was really, really upset about it. But what we had gotten in an argument about was not something I really wanted to talk to my parents about. And I remember coming home, and I was really sad, and my dad asked me what was wrong, and I was just, you know, the typical nothing. Um, And he said, no, I'm pretty sure that something's going on. What's wrong? Do you want to talk about it? And of course I said, no, I don't want to talk about it because I didn't want to tell him what the fight was about. It was about something that, you know, I shouldn't have been part of. And um, he said, well, just come sit with me. Let's just sit. And I sat next to him, and I remember he just, you know, held my hand, and he said, you know, you can tell me anything. I'm always, you know, on your side. I'm always on your team. And I just started crying. And I actually never told him what the upset was about. But I cried while sitting on the couch with him for probably 20 or 30 minutes. And he didn't really push. He pushed a little bit to to ask me what was going on, but he really was just there with me. And that's something that I always knew I could do with my dad was that if I was upset about something or if I had done something wrong and I had to tell him about it, I knew that he was always just going to physically be there for me. Sometimes if I actually told him what was wrong, he would give me a story from his own life, you know, and then it would make me realize that, oh, well, it happened to my dad. Like, this is a normal thing. So he would validate our feelings a lot. But he was just really good at at being there. A third thing that you can do, I actually have taken this idea from researchers Paykoff and Brooks Gunn in a 1991 article that they wrote. And they argue that parents need to sustain a goal-directed partnership with their teenager because conflict increases, inevitably increases in adolescence. And so you always have, as a parent, you always have to think about what your goals are for that specific interaction, but also just for your child in general. I think that we all want to raise self-sufficient, independent, happy, healthy humans. And so when you're thinking about the word choice that you're going to make or the things that you're going to do, the things that you're going to say to your teenager, you want to keep those goals in mind. Researcher Joseph Allen and several of his colleagues have worked on a number of research projects where they suggest that the capacity of parents and their adolescent children to maintain what he terms relatedness while disagreeing is a hallmark of attachment security. So it's okay to have conflict. It's inevitable. It will happen. Conflict itself is not a a sign of a bad relationship. Instead, it's about how you engage in the conflict. So you should maintain this relatedness. And researchers have said that this is by 
confidently stating your own opinion, allowing your child to confidently state their own opinion, and then both of you working towards validating and showing empathy for the other person's point of view. Even though the attachment needs in humans shift from early childhood to middle childhood to adolescence, in the end, everyone at any age still wants to feel loved and lovable. They want to feel like they are an enjoyable human and they want to feel safe and secure. Thank you all so much for joining me for episode four of season one of the Love Matters podcast. If you're following along in the Attachment Matters digital workbook, this episode went over information from chapter four. I hope you enjoyed the self-reflection prompt about turning points and the easy to follow tips for communicating attachment with children in middle childhood. I'd like to give a special thanks to my mom contributors in this episode, Rachel and Helen. Again, I am your host, Dr. Jenny Rozier, and as always, you can find me on Instagram at Relationships Love Happiness, on Facebook and YouTube by searching for the Relationships Love Happiness Project, and on the web at www.relationshipslovehappiness.com. I hope you'll join me for Episode 5, where I plan to talk about the evolution of attachment and trauma. Thanks for listening.